Our God is holy, and He is worthy of praise. And as we continue in our study in uh, the book of Acts of the Apostles with the uh, ends of the earth part two, we're expanding out and we're seeing how the gospel is going forth in a lot of areas. Now, as this gospel is going forth in a lot of areas, there are people that this is new information for them. And one of the things that you've heard this phrase before, you don't know what you don't know. And as the gospel is expanding throughout Asia Minor and over into to Greece, there are a lot of people that had ignorance about the truth that they were encountering. And they didn't know what it was. And the thing is, is for me, when I, as, as Sandra and I, as we served as, as cross-cultural missionaries and as we experienced different cultures, we came to understand that there are different perceptions and perspectives and there's some different understandings and sometimes there are different and there are misunderstandings about Christianity because of a, a lack of awareness, uh, a perspective that is unique because of the cultural background. And, and sometimes it w- just was a, a matter of being ignorant about Jesus. They, they didn't have any misunderstanding about Jesus. They just never heard the name of Jesus. When I think of the Christian Missionary Alliance, one of the things that we started off as a denomination was going to places where others were unwilling to go so that people could know this unknown God. And we, in the current situation that we live in, in America, is in a post-Christian context where there are distortions and and misunderstandings that result in people saying, I want to deconstruct the faith. Because, but in the process of deconstructing, they're wiping away the foundations of the faith. And so we live in a current situation where there are challenges and the God that we know and the Judeo-Christian foundations on which this country was established has become more and more dispersed to the point where the God that we worship is an unknown God in the midst of our own culture. Well, as we continue in our study through the book of Acts and, and Ends of the Earth Part 2, we're seeing now Paul arriving in the city of Athens. And God wants us, through this section, to understand the freedom that comes through encountering the truth. And whether a person has exposure of the past or is it being exposed for the first time to this unknown God, the gospel frees us to encounter God and to know and experience the truth. Before we get into the word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You are the God who communicates. You are the God who engages with this creation that you have made. You are outside of creation, but you engage with us, and you have put things in place so that we might desire to know you, and we might discover and uh, encounter you and be transformed by you. And so as we open up this word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be teaching us and how to apply these unchanging truths to our lives and circumstances, so that others around us might come to know the unknown God who can save them, the Lord Jesus Christ. Guide us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. The main idea that I want you to take away from today's message is that spirit-led observations produce spirit-directed conversations. When we are walking in the power of the spirit and we have our, our, our eyes up, and are in tune with the Spirit, as we're making observations, the Holy Spirit can take the observations that we make in the lives of others around us, in the culture around us, and can use that as a means of having Spirit-directed conversations that can lead people to the discovery of the unknown God, the God who is seeking them, the God who wants to be known by them. As we look at Paul in Athens, as he, he travels from Berea, the backwoods and the backwaters of Berea that we saw last week, now he travels down to, to Athens. We're going to observe three stages of his witness there in Athens. And the first was a uh, first stage of Paul's interaction in Athens was a very personal component, and that was through the provocation of impotent religion. As Paul arrives in Athens, he's confronted with the religion of Athens, and we read about that in verses 16 through 21. So if you have a Bible or a device, you can follow along, or you can follow along on screen as we read Acts 17, verses 16 through 21. It says, Now Paul was waiting for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him, 
as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. And for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. This is very fascinating because uh, as we, we pick up from last week, Paul was in the backwaters of Berea. Uh, uh, up north, and so we can go to the slide of the map. And so th we have uh, Thessalonica, and then he went from Thessalonica over to Berea. And if you'll recall, the Jews of Thessalonica traveled the 60 miles off the beaten Appian Way down to this backwater town of Berea where he preached the gospel. And the Bereans were of more noble character. They received the gospel, and even though the Jews of Thessalonica, who were jealous, came and followed them there, they, 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 they responded positively to the gospel, and many people believed, but the, the Thessalonican Jews stirred up the crowds at the marketplace of the Agora, and the Berean believers ushered them out. Now, if we, just so that you'll get some perspective, Berea is here. There's Mount Olympus. In the next slide, it takes down to, you see from Berea up there all the way down to Mount Olympus, down to Delphi. So we're going pretty, pretty far south. And in the next slide, we'll show the relation of, of Delphi over there to Athens. So that's where Athens was. So it was a, probably a couple hundred miles south where they went, and Paul is, is having this ministry in, in Athens now. Now, Berea was the backwaters. It was Podunk town. Athens was the center of study and culture, and you had the Acropolis, and you had a lot of, of powerful uh, people and philosophers that were, were living there in Athens. And so as Paul goes in, he sees the, the religious veneers that are around. You see, the, the Greeks, they were, they were pantheists or polytheists. They had their whole pantheon of gods that they worshipped. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to make sure that they were worshipping all of the gods and that they didn't offend any god. And so if there was something that was taking place, they would set up an altar of worship. And so Paul, while he's waiting in Rome, he was provoked in his spirit. The spirit provocation is so important. That word provoked in his spirit is actually, it's a, the Greek word is parasuno, and it's a compound verb which means literally to stick in the side. And so it says that while he's walking around Athens, the Holy Spirit is elbowing him in the side. He's poking him in the side and to, about what was going on because the city was full of idols. Now, if you've ever been sitting with your spouse sometimes and something is said which was, re relates to the other spouse, this, they might get an elbow, a poke in the side saying, pay attention, you need to listen to this. As Paul is going through Athens, the Holy Spirit is saying, look, this place is full of idols. This is a problem. This is a need. And it's also an opportunity. So the Holy Spirit was doing the provoking because he was walking around, he was attentive, and the Holy Spirit was drawing his attention to the idolatry that was there. It was disturbing to him. It was, it was disturbing on his, in his interior that these people are worshiping false gods. They are not encountering the truth of Christ. So what does Paul do? He did whatever he did, what he always did when he went to a city that was large enough to host a synagogue. He went to the synagogue and he, and he, and he preached to the, the Jews there and the, and the God-fearing Greeks. And so, but as he, as he does that, He's aware of the religious veneer of the culture around him with all of the, the idols that are taking place. But he didn't just stop there at the synagogue. He went to the people who would have the word of God and would be able to understand the word of God, but he, just, he didn't keep it in that holy huddle of the Jews in Athens. He went to the Agora, to the marketplace, where there were ideas. It was a common place. And he went there and he talked with whoever happened to be there. 
and to share about the gospel. So he started off in the place where there would be a, a biblical foundation for understanding the gospel, but he didn't refine it there. He went out into the highways and the byways. He went into the marketplace. He talked with the people in the market. <coughs> and as he was there, as he was talking, there happened to be some philosophers in the marketplace as well. These philosophers are Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. You know, Greece and Athens, they were at the center of the education and philosophy. Now, it's important to understand the difference between these two philosophers because the Epicureans were modern-day materialists. They didn't believe and they didn't embrace the gods of the pantheon, but if they did, it was only in the form of something that was physical and tangible, like a star or a planet or something like that. And so the Epicureans, their desire and their high aim was pleasure. They wanted to experience pleasure. So they were modern-day materialists, and they were looking for pleasure, and they were also trying to avoid pain. And so the Epicureans were, were sometimes almost even anti-religious, and so they were opposed philosophically to the Stoics. Now, the Stoic philosophers were the ones that believed in the pantheon, and they believed in the, in the gods, and they were, were more... Um, practicing in their belief system. And it was interesting because the, the Stoic philosophers, Stoi, the, the word Stoic uh, came from the painting on the, the friezes from, of Zeno because Zeno was the founder of the, the Stoic philosophers. And so they had paintings of Zenos down on the Stoa. And so that's why they called them Stoics because they had the painting of their, their, their philosophical leader. But it was interesting as well because Socrates was who was executed uh, by Hemlock by, by pre the, the preaching that he was teaching back uh, several hundred years earlier, was kind of a, a, a pre-Stoic in his perspective. And so they had these two competing philosophies, the Epicureans who were very materialistic and pleasure-driven, and the Stoics who were more serious and thinking about religious items. And so they're hearing Paul come in, and they're, they're, he's speaking, and so they, they start to ask questions about him. What is this teaching? This man seems to be preaching foreign ideas. And they called him a babbler. Now it's interesting that the word that they used to describe Paul as a babbler is a, a compound worm and it's a spermologos and it may, basically means seed picker. So uh, sperma being seed, logos word, so he was a word picker. And it was a term that would be described to to describe a bird that would fly around through the marketplace and, and pick up little seeds. And so there was a, a seed picker. It became a very pejorative term. And so it became a person who was nitpicking and would just engage in, in, in fruitless discussions to a point where it was a, a, a person of, of not repu a non-reputable person. So when they call him a babbler, they're calling him a, a seed picker, a nitpicker, a person who's really kind of foolish and doesn't know what he's talking about. So he didn't have a positive first impression, but what he was saying piqued their curiosity enough where they invited him to come to the Areopagus. Now the marketplace was the Agora. So you have in, in Athens, you have this Acropolis where they had all of those, those major pantheon of, of, of altars up there. But then you had the, the marketplace, which was down uh, south, and then you had the Agora, which was probably another, uh, excuse me, the uh, Areopagus, which was an area for more of the official courts or a philosopher uh, area. So the marketplace was where transactions took place. The uh, Areopagus was more of a uh, discussion of religious and educational things. And so they took him there. We don't know whether it was for a, a, a trial uh, or it was just a, a, a place where they could go to have an official evaluation of the things that he was saying. But as he goes in and he looks and he, and he goes to the Areopagus, he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection. That was an idea that was different to the Athenians. They didn't have the understanding of this concept of the creator God of the universe or of the resurrection. These were foreign concepts to them. So the things that Paul is saying is he is speaking truth even though it was in a context that they didn't fully embrace that. And so Paul is, is this, this viewed as this babbler. But he's doing this, he's talking because he sees the need. He sees the idolatry. He sees the deception that are, uh, that are holding these people down. Now, this past summer when I was in Thailand, 
uh, if you, I don't know if you recall anything when I gave a report about that, but, but there were these spirit houses that were all throughout, this, throughout the country. Each house would have their own little spirit house where they would have spiritual protection. And so when I was in Thailand, I kind of got this concept of what Paul was talking about when he walked through the city, and it was full of idols. When you walk through the city of, of Bangkok or up in, uh, in the, the, the interior, Udon Thani, there were, there were these spirit houses everywhere. It, you, there was no place where you could go where you couldn't see the spirit house. And so they're very religious people, but they're following these idols and these things which are not God. So Paul is invited to the Areopagus, and they, they say, we want to know more about this teaching, these things that you're saying. And this was, they had a lot of time on their hands, and so they wanted to, to, to listen, and they wanted to discuss. And it was almost an academic exercise. It was almost like the national pastime of the Athenians, or the city pastime of the Athenians, to have these debates and discussions about new ideas in the way that, that soccer is the the, the national pastime for most nations around the world outside of the United States. And so this is something that we're seeing as Paul is personally provoked by the impotent religion that he sees around him. I would like to ask, what observations are you making about your context, your city, your state, your nation, that provoke you to action? As you look around with spirit-led observations, what is the Holy Spirit provoking you to do to take action on light of what you observe around you? The forms of idolatry are different. We don't have spirit houses on every corner here in the United States. But if we look closely with spirit-led observation, we will see the forms of idolatry that are holding people in bondage and slavery. So let us be people who are spirit-led and sensitive to the poking in the side of the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction in the areas where we can work to have a positive influence in the culture around us. Well, not only was we see, did we see, as Paul went into Athens, the personal aspect of this transition where he was provoked by the impotent religion, we see the second stage of Paul's engagement in Athens and his witness, it was not just the, the personal, there was an interpersonal aspect of that as he communicated the power of the divine providence of the Lord. We read about that in verses uh, 22 through uh, 31 because when he starts to communicate the highlights and the power of God's divine providence, it blows away that, those intellectual smokescreen that the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers were putting up. It blows it completely away. So now he goes from his personal provocation as he's sharing these things. Now he's engaging in this debate, talking about the divine providence of God, which blows away those, those intellectual smoke screens, peels off the religious veneer to get down to the heart of the matter. We pick up in verses 22 through 31. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your, uh, of your worship, I, also, I found also an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the, the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He has made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him... We live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, 
but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And this is he who has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul is provoked by the Spirit of God at the idolatry around him. But he doesn't just stop by being provoked. He speaks. He says, I have a message which addresses the needs that you have that you aren't even aware of. And so he's very observant. And his spirit-led observation as he's walking through the town says he finds these altars and he finds this altar with this unique inscription. They've covered their bases, but just in case they weren't specific enough, they have an altar to the agnostios, the unknown God. They're covering their bases of saying, we have altars for a bunch of gods, but we might be missing one, and we don't want to miss out, so we're going to put this altar to the unknown God. And so Paul, through his observation, he makes a connection to the culture. He looks around, and he sees that they have, he acknowledges their religious roots. He acknowledges that they're a religious people. He does so without validating the objects of their religion, but he acknowledges that they're expressing a spiritual hunger. We need to be observant to see the spiritual hunger of those around us, even if they're worshiping something that we cannot condone or approve of. But we can leverage that they're following a false God because there's a hunger in the heart, and that helps us to know how we can connect with the culture. We can acknowledge the religious roots. That religious family from another religion, we can acknowledge that they are, are practicing a religion without validating that, but that provides a connection point of saying, oh, I see that you're very religious. I remember when I was in Marseille at a couscous restaurant, and there was Saeed, and Saeed wore a, 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 a white robe and had a long black beard, and it was at a couscous restaurant, and so it was pretty clear from his external attire and his, his beard that he was a practicing Muslim. And so as a Christ follower, uh, I can say, oh, are you a practicing Muslim? And he goes, yes, I am. I said, well, I'm not a Muslim, but I, I'm a Christ follower, and I practice my faith as well. And he's like, oh, that's great. So we can make an acknowledgment of the fact that he was very religious, and that became the connection point for having coffee together to have spiritual discussions. It didn't mean that I was validating his belief system, which denied the deity of Jesus Christ, because that would not be in the truth. But to find those points of connection, to acknowledge the connection and make the, the connection of a religious provides a context for discussions that could be exposing blind spots and areas of religious ignorance. This is what the Apostle Paul did. He said, you've got this altar to an unknown God, agnostheos, the unknown, we don't know. I want to help you no longer to remain in ignorance but to be informed so that you can make an informed decision. So he addresses that. He connects with the culture, but he also doesn't stop there with connecting with the culture. It wasn't just so that they would feel good about their culture. He was connecting with the culture so that they could be transformed by the truth and the one who transforms culture. So Paul moves from the connecting with the culture to connecting the people with the truth. And he, and he talks about the unknown God, the, wor the God that they are worshiping. And what he does is he says, you don't know him, so let me explain to you about this un unknown God. This unknown God that you have this altar to, he's not one who lives in a house made by men. He doesn't one that is fashioned with gold or silver. He is the one who created everything. He doesn't need to be served because he is Lord of all. So you don't have to make offerings and, and sacrifices at these, these altars. Because he isn't served by man, but he is the creator of all. He is the creator of everything that we see. <coughs> he goes on to say that from one man, and Paul, we know, is referring back to Adam, he made all of the nations. He explains that at the, he put people at diff different places at different times so that they might pursue him and seek him and find him. It's been interesting because I've been listening to one of my, my favorite preachers, Tony Evans, and his podcast. Um, 
and some of the sermons that he, that he preaches. And as he, he's talking about the, the aspects of, of, of racism and how we can combat that, Paul g- uses a silver bullet to combat racism in this passage. He says, from one man, all the races of the earth are brought forth. So there is one race, the human race. And so there's no place for racism in any way, shape, or form. And that's the message that he leads with, uh, speaking to the Athenians, who would make distinctions based on racial differences. But he says, all of us came from one person, Adam. And then through the Noah and his sons on the ark. And so all of the people that we see around us are coming from the same root of humanity. And he said, but the Lord put people at different places at different times and with different boundaries so that they might seek him and come to know him. God wants us to know him personally. And he uses these geopolitical situations and circumstances, the differences that might drive us apart. He uses those and puts these things so that we might draw together and come to know him who can change us and transform us. And then he goes on and he cites Examples from their own culture. He says, even as some of your own poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. Now, now he's not saying that everybody is a child of God. But he's saying that we are his offspring in the sense that we are created in the image of God. We have common parents. We're created in the image of God. And therefore, we are image bearers. And as image bearers of the Lord, God wants us to come into relationship with him. He wants us to experience his salvation and forgiveness. And he did that in a powerful way that you have never seen before. He did that in a way that's going to blow your mind. He took a man who lived without sin. He he sent him to the cross to die for your sins. And then he he raised him up on the third day. And he is resurrected again as evidence that your sins are forgiven. The price has been paid. If you will trust in Christ, then you can be forgiven And have a relationship with this God. This unknown God that you have an altar to. He is knowable. But he's knowable only through the one who died and rose again. He connects their culture to the truth of the resurrection. He appeals to the the created nature around. And saying, yes, we we live in this world. And the one true God made all that we see. And he created all of these cultures and these differences. Different people, one purpose. And all of that purpose is so that we might come to know him. God used these different methods that we might come to know him. That's the God that we serve. The God who is exclusive in the solution but inclusive in the call. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, (coughs) I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. One of my favorite missiological authors is is Don Richardson. In his book, he's written several great books, but in his book, Eternity in Their Hearts, he collates the the stories of God's redemptive analogies found throughout cultures. He was a a missionary and anthropologist, and so he worked with some of the most uh, primitive people groups in Papua New Guinea and and different areas. But as as he discovered things about the Sawi people in Papua New Guinea, he was curious of how, I wonder if these tendencies are manifested in other cultures as well. And so he began to do research and traveled the world and looked at different cultures around the world, and he found redemptive analogies within the culture, embedded deep into the culture, that showed that God had sown eternity in the hearts of people where they could discover the true and living God the one true God. And it was amazing to see the stories that were embedded in the culture that pointed back to the one creator God. And even to the point where at one point we were in harmony, but because of their sin they were separated. And now they were trying to find the way back. Paul uses the reality of the redemptive analogy in Athens, this altar to the unknown God, to connect the culture to the truth of the risen Lord. For us, we too need to be students of the culture, so that we can be effective communicators of the message of the gospel, which is the only thing that can change people's lives. He says, he's not far from us. 
You see him as the unknown God, but this unknown God, he is not unknown. He has not kept himself unknown forever. He is near, and he wants us to know him. He says, in the past, in times of ignorance, that has been ignored. That's not to say that he's, saying, he's ignoring the fact that they're worshiping false gods, but he's saying that he's patient and he's slow about executing judgment. And so he, he ignored, uh, he overlooked the, the, the fact that you're worshiping idols. Not that it's not important, but he's overlooked it from the standpoint that he's patient and not giving immediate judgment. And so he's wooing and drawing people to himself. The question I'd like to ask is, what observations are you making in your cultural context that can build communication bridges? The first is, the question I asked was, what is the Holy Spirit provoking in you? Now the second question is, what are the things that you observe where you can build bridges to communicate the transforming power? You can build bridges from the culture around you to the, tr the, the truth that transforms others, us and others. We all have subcultures that we operate in. If you are in the military, you're operating with a subculture. If you're in, in the world that we have today, there's a, the diaspora and the world is coming to us, and so we're actually having cultural and ethnic subcultures in our midst as well. What are the ways that we can connect to build communication bridges? But this leads to the, the third and final stage of Paul's ministry in, in, uh, in Athens, and it's a brief one because it involves the impact of his interactions with others leading to the definition of, of successful witnessing. We read about that in verses 32 through 34 because Paul was obedient to preach the resurrection. Verses 32 it says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, and among them were Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Darmus and others with them. See, earlier Paul called them, he said, to repent and to believe in Jesus who was raised from the dead. And the responses are different. When they, the resurrection was a little bit too much to handle for some of these, and so they mocked him. They made fun of him and said, what are you talking about rising from the dead? So we don't know how people will respond. So we can expect some mocking response because people, they have their human nature. And their human nature exalts tradition and pride. But tradition and pride are enemies to truth and grace. So we can expect mocking. And we can expect that the human nature will push back against this message of salvation. And we also can expect mocking is because there's spiritual deception and the enemy is trying to blind others from hearing the truth, having their heart touched and be transformed. The enemy is actively working to deceive both believers and non-believers. So there's opposition. So of course there's going to be people that are mocking. Sometimes believers will mock when someone preaches and calls for repentance and saying, God is not okay for you to continue in your sinful lifestyle. You are more worthy of that than to live in that sin. And so sometimes Christians will say they love their sin so much that they mock and say, oh, you're just being, you're being too hard and you're too, being too legalistic. Well, it's not about we're saved because we do it, but that doesn't diminish the importance of living holiness. But we also should, while we are expecting mocking, we should also expect repentance and faith because God's not done with us yet. In, in the same way that people have a human nature that is bound towards tradition and pride, everybody has human hunger in their hearts because the man-made religion or any substitute for Christ or of the Bible will ultimately leave us empty. We have that God-shaped vacuum in our hearts which can't be satisfied by anything but only by the Creator. Made known through Jesus Christ, as the famous philosopher Blaise Pascal said. And in the same way that there's spiritual opposition from the enemy that is creating the deception, which will create mocking, we also know that the Holy Spirit is working to drawing and wooing people to himself. And so we expect mocking, but we also expect repentance and faith. We expect mocking because of human nature and spiritual deception, but we also expect repentance and faith because we know there's human hunger and the Holy Spirit is working. We see this played out because Dionysus, one of the Areopagites, he was part of the council. He believed and he followed. According to Eusebius, one of the church fathers, 
Dionysus was the first bishop of Athens. So even though there were many people that mocked and only a few people responded in Athens, and we never really see uh, in the New Testament an establishment of a church there in Athens, we do know that there was an, an impact after the fact because of the church fathers, so, so years down the road. So as we look at this, we should have some expectation of our witness as we are spirit-led in our witness. Personal preparation plus Holy Spirit initiative will result in eight steps for successful witnessing. The first step is to make sure that you yourself are a Christ follower, that you've been born again. Secondly, a step to successful witnessing is to make sure that there's no unconfessed sin in your life. Thirdly, you need to make sure that you're walking in the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit and not trying to witness in your own flesh and strength. Fourthly, you need to be prepared to communicate your faith, to know what to say and how to say it. Fifthly, we need to pray. We need to talk to God about people before we talk to people about God so that he can do the work of preparing their hearts. Sixthly, we need to go to people. Take the initiative because people are, are probably not going to flood in off of the streets to come to a worship service to hear the gospel. You can invite them. You can go to them and you can invite them or you can go to them and you can present the gospel. And as they come to faith in Christ, you, then you can bring them and incorporate them into the body of Christ. Seventhly, when you go, make sure that you talk about Jesus. Don't talk about religion. Don't talk about church. Don't talk about political problems. Talk about Jesus because only Jesus saves. Only Jesus saves and transforms. And then, eighth step to successful witness, have the expectation that God can use even a knucklehead like you and me to have an impact in the lives of others. So what are the opportunities that the Lord is providing for you in your context to help people encounter the unknown God of the Bible? Because increasingly, the God that we serve, the Lord Jesus Christ that we worship, is in fact the unknown God in the culture and context around us because we live in a post-Christian world. So let us learn the lessons of Paul at the Areopagus, Paul in Athens, to be proclaimers of the truth, bold proclaimers of the truth, and introducing people to the unknown God around them that they might have a hunger for, but they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit-led observations produce spirit-directed conversations. In light of this, what's your next step going to be? Do you need equipping? If you need equipping in order to be an effective witness, please talk to me, and I would love to help you to do that. You might be equipped, and you need encouragement. Let me encourage you that success in your witness is not determined by how people respond to you, but by your obedience. When you are obedient to do what God has called you to do, the results are in the hands of God. So Paul was obedient to the provoking of the Spirit to go into the marketplace, to go to the synagogue. He was obedient. And even though massive numbers of people didn't come to faith in Christ, his witness was successful because he talked of Jesus and the resurrection. And even though there were a few, they were strategic. May the Lord help you take the next step with whatever it might be so that you might have an effective witness in this unknown God that is leaving the void in the hearts of people can be filled as they put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is the good news. May we proclaim it boldly. Let's pray.